Welcome to Stand and Deliver from Galway. On tonight's show, we have the outrageous Mike Wilmot from the northeast of England with the fabulous Sarah Millican. But first, Ireland's very own Carl Spain. Well, I like a bit of crack. I like having a bit of crack with my friends or whatever, you know, as we all do, I'm sure. That's a, well, really, you know, you're different to me. Um, <laughs> how would you expect us to relate to you, Carl? But I, I have this thing I constantly do. It's, I don't know, it's involuntary. I can't stop myself. Like, I'd be in... One of my friends, we were on the tube in London, right? And I'd stayed with her for the whole weekend. Um, she put me up, you know, fed me, which wasn't easy. And um, <laughs> she's heading on to work, and I'm getting off to change tubes to go to the, the airport. And I, no one talks to each other on the tube. Everyone's looking at the paper, not talking, just, all right, ignore everyone, pretend there's no one here. And as I get up, the devil comes on my shoulder, and I just turned. And as I'm walking off, I went, anyway, I'll talk to you soon. Let me know if I'm the father. <laughs> but there was a lot of us there that night. <laughs> and I'd go and leave her to deal with it. Everyone in the room. <laughs> Strangers were becoming friends. Did you hear what I just heard there? Is that... <laughs> Did I imagine that? And I've loads of them. I've loads of them that I do. And I... But I was, I, I was taught a valuable lesson. Because normally I'll do it and go. And by the time I meet the person again, we're laughing. It's, it, it's funny. But at the time they're going traumatised, going, oh no, what's going on here? I became the victim of it. We were out one night, friends in the pub. And it was the usual pub conversation started with myself and the lads just talking about, if you were to sleep with a Simpsons character, which one would it be? <laughs> and I'm thinking, there's no right answer here, is there? You know? One of Marge's sisters, I don't know. Well, you want to sleep with them for it? They're ugly. Like, it's going to happen, you know? <laughs> and then it led on to traumatic things that have happened in your life. One of the friends, he broke his leg when he was 12 years of age playing football in the back garden. And his mother checked his leg was broken, obviously, removed his trousers, then saw the leg was broken, put him into his younger sister's buggy and brought him into town, into the hospital. <laughs> so as well as, well, broken leg, he had his dignity removed and just... <laughs> 12 years of age and his sister's buggy all the way through his neighbourhood into town. And he's telling that. And we're not laughing. It's not funny. We're kind of giggling. You know, oh, that's, uh, that's it's a little bit funny, but sorry. So then I told my friends a story. I'd never told anybody this story. I'd never, I just came into my head and I said it. And I was telling them about when I was three and a half years of age. It was the day of my sister's sixth birthday party in our house. Big party in the house. You know, the first big party I remember as a child. Like, you know, it was all excitement. I was... You know, couldn't have been, I was so happy, everyone knew strangers, oh, this is great, you know. And big party all day. As the evening wore on, I was brought in to have my bath be put to bed. So I'm in the bath. My mother's there giving me my bath. It's 1970s Ireland. The phone rang. Now, when the phone rang in Ireland in the 1970s, it was like a fire alarm or an air raid siren. <laughs> Everybody ran. You know, there was no, that person could never ring back, you know. There was no caller ID. You never knew who it was. It was a mystery until they rang back. Did you ever ring? Have you rang before? When did you call? <laughs> At the time, was it, was it seven o'clock you rang on Saturday? Did you ring that? Was that you? So the, my mother's gone. I'm left sitting in the bath. Three of my sister's six-year-old friends came in. They saw me. I don't know. There were six-year-old girls. I don't know. Were they familiar with the penis? But my one obviously was a bit strange to them, right? They look at it and decide, that's wrong. We better remove it. <laughs> and it was like King Arthur's challenge of getting the sword out of the rock. They took turns in trying to remove my penis. I'm screaming the house down. The only reaction I'm getting from anyone is my mother going, I'm on the phone, will you be quiet? <laughs> anyway, yeah. The girl, I'm traumatised. Even now, I'm still nervous around older women. You know, it's just... <laughs> absolutely horrific, like, you know. Even now, I'm getting awkward t talking about it. The reason I'm telling you is because how it got out, right? I told my friends the story. They're, they're roaring laughing. They're thinking, ah, this is the funniest thing you've ever told us. I said, it's not funny. It's trauma. It's all right. It's not funny at all. You know, you should tell that story on stage. I'll never tell it on stage. It's too traumatic for me. And the reason I told it on stage is because I'd walked off. I was sulking a bit. So I went off to the bar and I'm going, you know, friends of mine. I only know them 25 years and I'm not going to hang out with them. <laughs> and I'm getting a drink and the bar is a bit busy. So it took me a few minutes to come back. And a few more friends had arrived. And as I'm walking my way through the crowd, one of the lads goes, Carl, Carl. Tell John about the time the three six-year-olds grabbed your cock. <laughs> I can explain, okay? Do I tell Everyone's looking at me going, oh, no, no, no. It's nice to be uh, in Ireland, where my grandparents are from, so it's just nice to see it in color. <laughs> Horribly depressing photographs of this country. 
when I grew up, there, there's, your, there's your grandfather, there's Dave, and there's, there's your grandma. <laughs> it's almost as though they didn't invent the smile till they came up with color photography. <laughs> it's, it's like, it's in color. Is it? Is it? <laughs> it's like real? So, I, I am from Canada, a, a weird uh, place to live, really. I, I, had, I, didn't, I didn't realize how weird my country was until I visited other countries. And uh, I had a bit of a midlife crisis last year, which is, I'm 47 now, and how I could dare at 46 say that's midlife. Like, I got a fucking chance at 92. <laughs> You know, I, I, I think midlife is when a man realizes any day now, really, any day now, a couple of good coughs and a bad shit and I'll be dead. You know what I mean? <laughs> but I, it's true. My, my, uh, a friend of mine, Derek, uh, uh, he owns a, a cabin in northern Ontario, quite a, like a nine-hour drive uh, north of Toronto, quite a bit away, where you're, you're, there's fuck all. And he's a bit older than I am, and he says, you know, when I, when I had my little crisis, uh, what I did was I, I went up to my cabin, I just stayed there for, my, for a week by myself. And you'll be amazed at what you learn. And this is the fucking winter, it's minus 20. Because you, you step there for a week by yourself, and you will learn a lot about yourself. Now, I don't know how to drive, so I was left there, and he fucked off. <laughs> and the first thing I learned about myself was I'm not to be left alone in a cabin. <laughs> Turns out I'm not big on me. I don't like being near me for that fucking long. And there's something terrifyingly lonely about Northern Canada, which I have to explain to my Irish cousins here. That there's a thing, Northern Canadian radio. Now radio, uh, I, I think, was invented to alleviate boredom. But Northern Canadian radio, adds to it beautifully. <laughs> Not a, these people aren't supposed to be on the radio. Like, the, the morning show, how many morning shows start with this? Like, hello? But that's not a, that's, that's, that doesn't get you out of bed, does it? Oh, is, is someone listening to me? If, can you tap your radio so I know I'm, on, I'm not alone as well? But, they know who they're talking to. Uh, for instance, uh, the, the show will start with uh, coming up in the next three hours. <laughs> no, no one in life tells you what's coming up in the next three hours. Only Northern Canadian Radio, because they know you're, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> you're fucked for the next three hours. They know they're talking to invalids. They're talking to unemployed people that can't get out of bed. They're talking to people that are pinned under farm equipment in some you know, giant warehouse somewhere, trying desperately to chew their own fucking leg off so they can crawl across the warehouse floor and unplug that radio. Uh, coming up in the next three hours. And this is not written, I swear to God. Uh, come, from the uh, Ottawa Folk Festival. Like, that's going to entice excitement. Uh, all the way from the Ottawa Folk Festival, we have Mr. James Hills, the Jimi Hendrix of the ukulele. <laughs> I, I didn't know what to do. Like, I can understand being relatively good at a ukulele, but... Getting Jimi Hendrix good? <laughs> You're just a stubborn fucker. That's your problem is. You're not a musician. You're just evil. It's a ukulele. And we've all picked one up. And that's enough. This stubborn fucker got Jimi Hendrix good at it. So I waited uh, three hours, hoping he'd be shit. And he played Little Wing, one of my favorite Hendrix tunes. And it might have been because I was alone. I cried a little. It was, it was beautiful. And his name is James Hills. So go out there and get his CD. <laughs> and you'll listen to it once, my friend. 
and you will throw away all your other uh, ukulele CDs. As soon as, you, as soon as you hear that, what the fuck have I been listening to? It's like being good at a tuba. Who could fucking care? Who could possibly give a shit? Bill Bell, by the way, apparently is the world's best tuba player, and that destroys me. What, what's the shit one sound like? I can't, how do you, here. How, what's Bill doing that's freaking out the tuba community? Oh, fuck, Bill, you went the other way. We were all, but you went, you and that ukulele fuck should put together a CD called Stubborn Fuckers. I don't do a lot of television comedy. <laughs> the, the last television comedy I did was in uh, Moncton, New Brunswick, in Canada. <laughs> Had to throw that third part in, because the rest of you were, was it like on the moon? <laughs> and I, I'd like to perform for you now, if I could, uh, a joke that was rejected from the Moncton Comedy Festival in Moncton, New Brunswick, in Canada. <clears throat> so I'm in Fredericton, which is also <laughs> in uh, New Brunswick, Canada. So I'm in Fredericton, you know how they can be. <laughs> and I drove by the Potato Research Center. Seems the people in Moncton are comfortable with the concept of a potato but those in Fredericton are still looking into it. <laughs> Did I hear a, a faint round of applause from someone at the bar going, that's so fucking Fredericton, that is. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know why I make fun of potatoes. I basically am one. <laughs> I, love, I love the potato. It's, fucking perfect. It is. You can fry them, you can bake them, you can boil them, you can smash them up, you can eat the fuckers raw, and if you leave them under the sink, they turn into more potatoes. <laughs> I, how there was a famine is beyond me. How, what are you, you fuckers run out of sinks? Is that what it was? Join us after the break when we'll hear Sarah Millican say... What's your favourite thing about living on your own, love? The day Sarah Millican came to town. The day Sarah Millican came to town, she was informed of the value in brown ball gowns, but remained unconvinced by what she found. And postcards for the Donkey Express left her equally unimpressed. And it was for no greater reason that she was stalked by a mother and son. Mother in white and son in brown, they followed Sarah Millican all over town. And they weren't the only ones. There was the fella who shopped in Dalmatian and his mother, the one with the lazy tongue. They also followed Sarah Millican. That's a good start. I was going to start off with a bit of advice. I'm not really very good at giving out advice. I give an example of how. I was in a supermarket recently and I saw this young couple wandering round. And the girl said to her boyfriend, have we got everything? And he said, I think so. And I looked in their basket and all they had was a bottle of rosé and a cucumber. <laughs> and I just thought, there's no way they've got everything else they need in for a salad. What I should have said is, lube, love. <laughs> That's what you need. Lube. But I didn't. <laughs> She's got to learn the hard way. 
but uh, well, I was going to say I'm highly strong, but I don't think that's right. I get, I get myself agitated very easily. Let's say that. That sounds much better, doesn't it? I get agitated. I'll give you an example of when I've been agitated. Uh, I was recently in a hotel room on my own, and I got trapped in my bra. <laughs> I can see the women are looking at me like, tell me how it happened so it doesn't happen to me. <laughs> and the men are just happy that I'm talking about bras, aren't you? So I was in a hotel room, I went to fasten my bra. Nice lady, are you a back fastener or a front and swizzel? A back freak. Um, <laughs> if I could do that, I'd be in the bloody circus. <laughs> I'd just be fastening bras, though I don't have any other circus skills. I asked a lady recently, I said, are you a back fastener or a front and swizzle? And she went, neither, I do the third one. <laughs> I said, this is not a third one. She said, there is. She said, I just sort of fasten it and put it on like a jumper. <laughs> I'm just guessing, but I don't think your bra is the right size, love. <laughs> Occurred to me that if there's a third option, then there must be a fourth option as well. Just fasten it and step in the fucking thing. <laughs> but I, I'm a front and swizzler, so I started to swizzle. I just got out of the bath, so I was a bit, you know, sticky. <laughs> Get down, men. <laughs> just did an eyebrow raise. I think I'm in there. Um, <laughs> And uh, I started to move it round and it got stuck about there. And, you know, there weren't any boobs in it. It wasn't functioning at all as a bra. And the thought that crossed my mind was, I wonder if the fire brigade come out for this. Did you say you were trapped in your car, madam? <laughs> I could get in the car, if that helps. <laughs> if you promise just to keep cutting. <laughs> you better bring your wire cutters. <laughs> I'm from South Shields in the northeast of England, but I live in Manchester now, and uh, it's nice to travel in this job. I got to go to Australia uh, in April for the Melbourne Comedy Festival, which was great until it came time to come and home, uh, where because of the volcano, or as we call it, the fucking volcano, uh, <laughs> got stranded for an extra week. You finally don't get any sympathy off your friends if you tell them you're stranded for an extra week in Australia. My friend said, you are stranded for an extra week in Australia. Well, boo fucking who? I said, yeah, but listen to the word that you're using. It's stranded. It's not a good word, is it? You could be stranded on the end of Brad Pitt's cock and you'd want to go home eventually. <laughs> I mean, after a week or so, obviously. <laughs> For snacks, if nothing else. <laughs> it explains why his girlfriends are always so skinny. <laughs> he doesn't provide enough snacks. But when I was in Australia, I got a phone call from the fraud department of my credit card company inquiring why I was spending quite so much on my credit card. I thought it was my mum at first. <laughs> but it was a lot less scary. It was just the bank. And she said, can I check a couple of transactions with you? And I said, by all means. The first one was just a cash point withdrawal, and I had withdrawn the money, so that was all above board. Second one, she said, you spent £102 in a place called Holtz. And I went, yeah, um, it's a chocolate shop. <laughs> And she went, 102 pounds? <laughs> went, yeah, they were for presents. For me. Because <laughs> I was nowhere near Brad Pitt's cock. <sighs> I did get a new nickname while I was out there when I was in Australia. I've never had a nickname before. I've been called things, but that's different, isn't it? <laughs> My nickname is the Cake Pigeon. Because whenever I walk past a cake shop, <laughs> walk past. <laughs> Whenever I press myself up against a cake shop, <laughs> I go, ooh. <laughs> but I've got on my web, a lot of comedians have websites, and on my website there's a, a button you can click in order to see pictures of cakes and puddings that I've eaten over the years. <laughs> over the years, over the months. <laughs> and I'm sort of weirdly proud of those photographs, bizarrely proud. Like, I don't have children, but I imagine it's very similar to when you get to show pictures of your kids to people. So proud. Don't ask us to pick a favorite. It's hard to imagine he's to carry those inside of me. <laughs> but because I sometimes talk about cakes on stage, people will occasionally bring cake to gigs for me, which might sound nice, but it can sometimes be a little bit weird because it is still essentially cake from a stranger. <laughs> There's a man came up to me at a gig in London and he said, I've got you some cake. And I thought, oh, great. And he handed me a carrier bag with a slice of unwrapped cake in the bottom. <laughs> it's already wrong, that, isn't it? But I wanted to be polite because he'd done it out of sweetness. And I said, that looks lovely, Pet. Thank you very much. That looks like carrot cake. I said, carrot cake. And he went, it's passion cake. 
I think I know cake and I don't think passion cake exists. I think it's carrot cake plus raw hypnol equals passion cake. <laughs> I mean, I still ate it. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, if you're worried that something's got raw hypnol and you just eat it at home, don't you? Because then you get a lovely night's sleep as well. And because you've forgotten, you don't even feel guilty the next day. <laughs> I find I'm not very good at relaxing. I'm rubbish, absolutely rubbish at relaxing. A friend of mine just said to me, just have a bath, just have a bath. And I'm not normally a bath person because I'm always zipping about, I always have showers. I still buy all the things you're supposed to put in the bath, all the bath bombs and the lotions and potions. But then the only time I ever have a bath is when I'm in a hotel. And of course, I haven't taken those things with us, have I? All I've got is like an inch of shower gel slash shampoo slash toothpaste, whatever, <laughs> with which I'm expected to wash a 12-stone woman. <laughs> I mean, me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't like provide a service. <laughs> Come on in, get on the scales. Yes, you're all right. Go and get your clothes off, flower. Arms up. <laughs> but uh, yeah. I, I, did, I, I had a massage. Give us a cheer if you've ever had a massage. It's nice, isn't it? I had a massage. I took my boyfriend. I thought it would be dead romantic if we went together. Not romantic at all. It was incredibly stressful. He panicked all the way there in the car. And just as we got out the car, he just blurted out, what if I get an erection? And I went, you won't get an erection. You won't get an erection. <laughs> Would it help if I punched it? <laughs> and it did, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I do find uh, spending time with my family quite relaxing. Um, I think it's something to do with being in the family home. I find it, you know, quite soothing. It's not always relaxing. I took my mum and dad and my sister out for quite a nice lunch just before Christmas. And out of nowhere, my mum just went, when me and your dad go, we're going to go together. <laughs> I said, what, what are we talking about now? When me and your dad go, we're going to go together. I said, are you talking about a suicide pact? <laughs> And she went, no, we're not going to call it that. <laughs> so that's still what it is then. And I said, is this imminent? Because it was just before Christmas and I had some presents I could take back to Marks and Spencer's. <laughs> and she said, no, in like 20 or 30 years' time. So I looked at my sister, and I was still doing the what the fuck face. I did the what, what, at my sister. And she quite calmly just said, as long as they leave me a letter explaining it, because I'm not going to go to prison for them. It's just getting steadily worse. So I looked at my dad. My dad's like the voice of reason in our family. I looked at my dad and I said, what do you think about this? And he went, first I've heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> he looked genuinely gutted as well. <laughs> he had massive plans for what he was going to do after my mama died. <laughs> <laughs> but you've been a lovely audience. I'll leave you on this. But I've uh, got a lovely boyfriend. He's very sweet. We've been together for four years. And I said to him in January, I think it's about time we started talking about the future. And that's what I expected from him, like an awkward silence, uh, maybe some footsteps as he walked out of my life. <laughs> but he didn't, he just smiled. He just beamed. And I was really touched, and I thought, oh my God, he wants to spend his future with me. Yay. And I said, are you sure you're all right talking about the future? And he went, what, like flying cars and that? <laughs> You'll be lovely, thank you very much, good night. in a part of Dublin called Fingless. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard of it. <laughs> somebody laughed. <laughs> There's always somebody that knows it. They're like, yeah, went there to get the car back. <laughs> like, you know, have you ever had a text message of a 15-year-old? That sounds so bad. Have you ever had a text message? <laughs> Technology is getting on top of us.